Okay, if you would open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All right, we got through verse 5 last week. And we got all this rearranged here. This up here. Okay, we got through verse 5 last week. We've been going through basically what he's doing here is in chapter 4. He was talking, Paul was talking about how we've got a much better ministry than what Moses and what they had in the Old Testament because that was the administration of death where they administered the Mosaic Law, which of course none of them could keep. And the ministry we have today is the ministration of the Spirit. So it's really the ministration we have today is of life and not of death. And that's why it's so important to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, most people think that we follow the red letters of Jesus, but really, Jesus was ministering death to Israel because they weren't saved, and so he told them to keep the law. Why did he tell them to keep the law? Well, so the law would teach them that they couldn't keep the law so that they would come to Christ so that they might be justified by faith. But because of their unbelief, they're under the law, which ministers death. But when we understand that we're in the dispensation of grace, then we see the ministration today isn't of death or of the law, but it's of life. It's of the Spirit of God. Uh, So that's why churches are so dead, is because they're following a law that we're dead to. Paul says, I'm dead to the law. I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God, Galatians 2.19. So we have this ministration of the Spirit, God's word rightly divided, sound doctrine of Paul's epistles, get that in the inward man, and make our decisions based on that using the mind of Christ. And that's the ministration of the Spirit. And as a result, when we apply that, then we are are going against the course of this world, the God of this world, and so then we're going to be uh, going through tribulation. Mainly from our flesh, our flesh doesn't like it, but also tribulation from the world, and especially from churchianity, because they're following the ministration of death found in the red letters. And so then Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 talks about those tribulations, but then we shouldn't be discouraged by those tribulations because, as verse 17 says in chapter 4, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. And the things of this earth, verse 18 says, are temporal or temporary. But the things of the Spirit, the things of God, are eternal. And so now when we get to chapter 5, what he's doing is he's saying, well, we got to concentrate on the eternal. Look at the things, set our affection on the things above, not on things of the earth. The eternal things of the Spirit that are, in, that are the spiritual things rather than the temporal things of the flesh. And so in chapter 5, he's been talking about how... Um, we, re- we can rest in that because we know. He starts in chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hand, eternal in the heavens. So he's been focusing on these first five verses, focusing on that, uh, that heavenly building of God, a permanent glorified body that God will give us to have God's love come through us through the scripture that we've learned and applying that scripture in heavenly places for all eternity. And the emphasis is on we know this. We know this to be true. So now we're in verse 6, and again we're going to see, reading verse 6, it says, Therefore, we are always confident. Why are we always confident? Well, because in verse 5, it says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God. And we talked last week of how God started something new in Christ when he raised him from the dead. He wrought that that new, that body of Christ. He worked it in Christ. And Christ uh, got that eternal life given to him by the Father due to his faith in what the Father told him to do. Raised him from the dead, set him in his own right hand, far above all principality, power, mind, and dominion. And so since God wrought that in Christ and we are placed into Christ when we believe, then we know, as verse 5 says, that he hath wrought us for the self-same thing. 
So then that, that's why he could say, verse 6, we are always confident. And if you don't understand that the principles that you see in Paul's epistles, that we're taken out of Adam, we're placed into Christ, and Christ, <clears throat> God wrought that eternal life, that glorified body for Christ, because he defeated death and hell. And since we're in Christ, then we also receive a glorified body. Death and hell have no power over us, thanks to the saving work of Christ. And when we understand that, then we set our affection on things above, and we are always confident that that's going to be for us. So when we apply sound doctrine, and our flesh persecutes us for doing so, and the world persecutes us for doing so, and churchianity especially persecutes us for doing so, we won't be shaken by that. We won't be moved. But we'll be always confident knowing that we will be rewarded for that. We will get a glorified body. It will be eternal in the heavens. No one can take that away from us because God did that in Christ, and Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, and we are in Christ. Therefore, we know God will raise us from the dead. He will give us a glorified body. And that eternal way to glory is worked as we have trials uh, we face those trials as a result of living the in Christ life. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth and understand the separate ministry of the Apostle Paul, you're not going to get that. And if you don't understand that, then it's what most of churchianity does. It's, well, I hope I make it to heaven. You know, churchianity isn't even assured that they're going to make it to heaven. I mean, when Lana was in the hospital and she died, she didn't fear Keith Blades, I remember I was going to John Verstegen's church. He's a right divider. He was up in Canada. He had cancer. He knew he was going to die. And he was rejoicing. Very few Christians are confident that they're even going to make it to heaven. I mean, certainly, you know, even if they've been taught eternal security, they still have those doubts that churchianity has put into them, how they got to keep short accounts with God and confess their sins. And so even on their deathbed, if they teach if they believed eternal security, they're thinking, well, did I really have true saving faith? You know, because that's what eternal security teaches. Maybe you don't have true saving faith. Or for the other parts of denominationalism, they'll say, uh, well, I didn't keep short accounts with God. I didn't confess my sins. But even if I did, maybe there are some sins that I did that I don't know about that I didn't confess. And so there are all these doubts. And so there's a fear of death. But when we know that it's not about me keeping short accounts with God, making sure I had true saving faith. It's just I know I've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. I know I've been placed into Christ. I know that God wrought that glorified body in Christ, raised him from the dead, gave him eternal life. And so I can be confident that God is going to do that with me. And so that what that does is not only does that assure me that I'm going to be in heavenly places, but then I'm also willing to suffer for the doctrine. And I gave the example. If I go to the gym every day and I work out hard, I mean, I'm really laboring there, putting forth the effort, but I don't gain muscle or I don't lose weight, I end up gaining weight, I don't see the results. I'm not going to keep going with that because I say, I don't really like sweating and working hard and not getting any benefit from it, so why do it? And that's what most of churchianity does, is that they're on that treadmill hoping that they make it to heaven. And they're so worried about their eternal life that they're under, they put themselves under the law. And so then they can't serve Christ. Galatians 2.18 says, If I build again the things which I destroy, meaning if I put myself under the law, I make myself a transgressor. So you're not going to live for God if you're under the law. Instead, you're going to try to live for yourself to make sure you obey the law. But when we understand Paul's epistles and we understand we're dead to the law, then we might live unto God. And we're confident that because God raised Jesus from the dead and gave him a glorified body and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, we're confident that God will do that for us. Not because I kept short accounts with God, not because I had true saving faith, but because Christ did all the work for me. And so then I don't worry about my salvation. And instead I concentrate on living in grace, getting the doctrine in the inner man and making decisions based on that. And then I live for God. So that's why he's going into these things. He says in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house is dissolved, 
Verse 6, we are always confident. Verse 8, we are confident. So having confidence, the assurity that we will be in heaven and that we will be rewarded for having the doctrine work in our inner man that results in us letting God work through us. Because we can see the spiritual impact there. Because we're walking, as he says in verse 7, the verse I missed there, we walk by faith and not by sight. But if I'm under legalism, that's not faith. It says over there, I think it's in uh, Romans 4 and verse 14. Romans 4, 14. It says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Verse 4, Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So you can see the difference here between faith and law. They just don't mix. So when you put yourself under a system of I got to keep short accounts with God, then I'm not walking by faith. If I'm not walking by faith, then I'm not walking by that promise and I'm not looking at heavenly things. I'm walking by the law. I'm looking at uh, carnal things, the wor things of this world. The law is spiritual, Romans 7, 14 says, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So if I don't have a victory in Christ over the law, then I am trying to use my flesh because I'm not trusting in what Christ did on the cross, but I'm trusting in me keeping short accounts with God. So then I'm trying with my carnal flesh to try to obey a spiritual law. And since I'm in the flesh trying to do it, because I'm not trusting in the finished work of Christ, then I'm walking by sight and not by faith. Faith and the law do not mix. So that's why it's so vital that we rightly divide the word of truth, understand the work that God did in Christ, and that we have that by faith and not by any works we did. And we don't keep it by works, but it's still Christ working in us. So, with that background there, let's look at uh, verse 6 here. So, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and this is, uh, a lot of times, this is a good verse to go to, verses 6 and 8, when people wonder, because there's that doctrine out there that people will say it's called soul sleep. I know E.W. Bullinger, who was a, a, a right divider, but really an Acts 28 uh, dispensationalist. So you could call him hyper-dispensational if you want. Uh, but he had the doctrine of soul sleep, which meant that when you die, then you go to the grave, but then your soul and your spirit does not rise to be with the Lord when you die. So uh, you're, you're just not anywhere. You're asleep. That's why they call it soul sleep. So your soul is there in the grave with your body along with your spirit, and it's all asleep. And then when you when the rapture takes place, then your body, soul, and spirit all go to be with the Lord. But in the meantime, it's just like you're asleep. There's no consciousness, nothing, nothing going on. Uh, that's the doctrine of soul sleep. But here it's, it's quite obvious here from verse 6. It says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So it makes it clear there that, um, that when we're in this flesh, when our heart's beating and our air is going through our lungs, when that's happening, uh, that's when we're home in the body, then we're not with the Lord. So we're not in heaven right now. But we are confident that, verse 8 says, that when we are absent from the body, it doesn't say that our soul goes to sleep and then we don't actually go to heaven until the rapture. It says we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So it shows you that once you die, um, then your soul, your spirit is absent from the body. The soul is really who you are. The flesh, as we've seen, is just a a holding uh, thing for your soul. You know, we saw in verse 1 that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, well, that's your flesh, it's dissolved, then we have a building of God, a house not made with hand, eternal in the heavens. So it shows who you really are isn't your fleshly body. 
Your fleshly body is just the container that holds your soul. And right now it's a pretty lousy container because it wants to do things that are contrary to God and His Word because it's under that sin nature. Um, but there's going to be, come a time when it is dissolved and then we're going to have a glorified body. And that's that eternal uh, building of God. Now that takes place, if you go to Philippians chapter 3, that takes place at the rapture in terms of what verse 1 says. When our earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved and we get a building of God uh, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Um, so it says in Philippians 3 verse 20, Philippians 3 verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're looking... The idea there is when we're in heaven, we're in heaven, because um, positionally speaking, that's where we are. Ephesians two six says that you are seated together with Christ in heavenly places right now. So you're in heavenly places right now, as far as God is concerned. Again, I'm not physically there, but God is the God who calls those things which be not as though they were, and He looks outside of time, and so He can see us in heavenly places with Christ because that's where Christ is right now, and we are in Christ. So God could see us there, even though physically speaking, I'm still on this earth. So that's why verse 20 says, from whence. Our conversation is in heaven, from whence. So from our position in heaven, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if I'm already in heavenly places, why am I looking for a Savior? I mean, He's already saved me, right? If I'm already seated together with Christ in heavenly places, then he's already saved me. So why am I looking for a savior? Well, the answer is that my soul and my spirit, that's a done deal in heavenly places as far as God is concerned. But the body, we're still in our vile flesh. So God looks at us and he says, you're accepted in the beloved. You have eternal life. Forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Uh, you have the Spirit of Christ within you, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You've got God's completed Word. You've got every tool you need to have Christ live through you perfectly by God's Word at all times. But you've got a significant barrier, and that is your vile flesh, your vile body, which is it has sin nature. Romans seven eighteen says, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So I have the capacity to serve God in my soul and my spirit, but I also can choose to operate in the lust of my flesh. And Paul says in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I serve Christ, but with the body I serve the flesh. So he's saying you need to, the problem is you've got all the tools necessary to let Christ live in you, and live according, live a godly life. God's pertain unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But the problem is, we still have our vile body and our sin nature there. And so, we're looking for the Savior, basically the Savior of the body, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the rapture takes place, then He's going to come from heaven, and He's going to, verse 21, He's going to change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We have in the flesh the sentence of death, because in my flesh dwells no good thing, it's sin, and the wages of sin is death. And so it's under the flesh is under the power of death. But because Jesus Christ conquered death, he made that full payment for us, then at the rapture, then he is going to subdue all things into himself. He's going to take away the death that resides in my flesh and give that life. Now, I've already got that in my soul. My soul was dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So I had, I had death in my soul. But then when I recognized my sin and trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin, then my soul was made alive in Christ. So I've got eternal life in my soul. But it's my flesh that is still vile. And it's not until the rapture 
when that vile flesh is fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's when we receive, that, and that's what we've been talking about there in 2 Corinthians 5, 1. That our earthly house of this tabernacle, now the earthly house of this tabernacle, when we, when we die, then we, that goes to, basically we become absent from the body. So, you know, the doctrine of soul sleep, actually what's technically correct is you could call it body sleep. Because your soul, when your body dies, then your soul and your spirit leave that. Because verse 8 there, 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, All right, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So that verse there tells you that once I leave my body, I breathe my last breath, I leave my body, my soul and my spirit, they don't sleep. But then I go to be with the Lord. I'm present with the Lord. But then I'm still waiting from that position in heaven. Philippians 3 tells us, from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So what actually happens when we, when we die? Our soul doesn't sleep. Our soul goes to be with the Lord. But our body sleeps. That's why in John 11, in fact, let's go over there and you can see that. Here's Lazarus. Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. Luke 16 tells you that. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. So he's in paradise um, there because he died. Physically speaking, he died. But when Jesus tells the disciples about that, he doesn't say Lazarus died because absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So the moment that Lazarus' body died, his soul and his spirit went on to be with the Lord in Abraham's bosom in paradise. But then his body is still in the ground. It hasn't, as 2 Corinthians 5, 1 talks about the earthly house of this tabernacle being dissolved. We have a building of God. It's not, the earthly house, when we die, isn't dissolved. It goes to the ground. That's why Philippians 3.21 says that Christ will change our vile bodies that may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. But he doesn't do that until the rapture. So in John 11, when Lazarus dies, um, you see, uh, let's see here. Uh, in verse 11, John 11, 11, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. So when Lazarus died, his soul and his spirit went to Abraham's bosom, Luke 16. He's there in paradise with the Lord, but his body is asleep. So when he says, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Verse 12, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Verse 13, how be it? Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Verse 14, Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. See, the disciples are doing just like most of us. They're walking by sight and not by faith. So when Jesus says Lazarus sleeps, they're thinking, physically speaking, materially speaking, they're thinking, well, he's, he wasn't feeling good, so he went to the bed and he's sleeping there. So he said, let's not wake him. But Jesus is talking about, spiritually speaking, he's looking at things eternal. And he says, Lazarus is absent from the body. He's present with the Lord in Abraham's bosom in paradise. So then what's left of Lazarus here on the earth is his body. And his body is asleep. So Lazarus is dead means Lazarus, his body is asleep. And so when he said in verse 11 that I go that I may awake him out of sleep, that means I'm going to take his body, it's going to rise from the dead. So his soul and his spirit is going to go out of Abraham's bosom and go back into his body, and then he's going to raise up, which, you know, everybody looks at John 11 as this wonderful miracle of resurrection, which it is. It's a type of what's going to happen with us at the rapture for Israel at the second coming. Uh, and so it's a wonderful miracle, yes, but uh, it was wonderful for everybody but Lazarus. Lazarus got the bum deal. I mean, you saw in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul says, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body 
and to be present with the Lord. And Philippians 1.23, and Philippians 1.23, Paul says, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Lazarus went to be with the Lord. He's in paradise, Abraham's bosom. That's far better than being on this life, on this world, on this earth. And now God's going to send his soul and his spirit back down into that vile body, which, by the way, has already started decaying because he stinks. It's been in the grave for three days. The body stinks. It's decaying. It's wrapped in grave codes. It's bound up. So what would you rather do? Would you rather be with the Lord in paradise where you're never going to sin again? You got rid of that vile flesh. Or after being there three days, would you like to go back into your vile body, which you're going to sin again and again and again, and your vile body has already started rotting, it already stinks, and you're wrapped up in grave clothes you can't even move. Uh, wait, which one sounds better to you? Well, Paul says in Philippians 1.23, that to be with Christ is far better. Far better. And yet here, Jesus says, I'm going to wake him out of sleep. I bet when Lazarus heard that, and I don't know if he could, you know, hear, I would think he would know what's going on uh, there in Abraham's bosom. When he heard that, he probably said, no, don't, don't raise me from the dead. I'm loving it here. I got to go back down there, man. The Pharisees persecuted me all the time. I'm a Bible believer. And... They kicked me out of their church, the religion. I mean, it doesn't say that in the Bible. You could assume that's the case, uh, associating with Jesus, being a Bible believer. I, I don't want to go back to that. Uh, <laughs> so, but we look at it as a great thing. God raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, it is a great thing. It shows God has the power over death. But uh, for Lazarus, it was a terrible thing. He was in paradise. Now he's got to go back to that vile flesh. Now, I would assume that Jesus probably healed the decaying part. It probably wasn't rotting anymore. Uh, maybe not. Maybe it was a sign of his resurrection. Maybe he left it around. I don't know. Um, and they did take him out of his grave clothes. But um, it was a bum deal for him. <laughs> so, you know, people talk about the soul sleep. Well, it's clear from this verse here that what was sleeping wasn't his soul, but was his body. His body was already with the Lord. He was already in Abraham's bosom at paradise. And same thing for us. 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about those who sleep in Jesus. So the sleeping isn't the soul, but it's your body. So going back there to 2 Corinthians 5 now. So verse 6, and that's what he says there, we are always confident. And that's the key to living the Christian life. It's not, well, I'm going to toe the line. I'm going to keep short accounts with God. I'm going to make sure I do everything the church says, and then I'll be fine. And then, you know, maybe I'll make it. And you put up this front, because most all, most all people who go to church on a regular basis do, is you ask them, you know, do you know you're going to heaven? Oh, yes, I know I'm going to heaven. Yeah, they'll say that, because they got to keep up a front. But their church has taught them that their salvation is conditional. Either they've got to continue to do works or stay from sin or make sure they don't backslide by going to the church on a regular basis, um, you know, certain things, avoiding a sinful lifestyle, whatever that means, because we all sin. Um, so it's just not being as bad as the world. You know, we're just a little better, so somehow that's God's going to accept it. But if I fall back to the patterns of the world, then I'm not okay. You know, the, exactly how you measure that, I don't know. But um, they're, they're saying... That, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. But the problem is, that's just part of the front of churchianity. So when it comes down to, you know, it's your time to die. You know you're leaving this earth. That's why people say they don't want to die alone. You know, somebody hold my hand while I'm, while I'm going. You know, be there at my last breath. Um, because they aren't, verse 6, they're not always confident. And even if you're still confident, I mean, you still may want a loved one to be there. I can understand that. But um, it's just that fear that even those who say they are Christ professing Christians, who say they know they're going to heaven, who say they know that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has atoned for their sins, they still have a doubt because churchianity has placed it into them. 
But if we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If we are confident in that, if we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, because the work that God wrought in Christ when he rose him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places, and we know from Paul's epistles that we are we are taken out of Adam, we are crucified with Christ, so we're taken out of Adam, we're placed into Christ's death, then we are also going to experience the likeness of his resurrection. So when we know those things, then we should not be afraid to die. And in fact, we should be looking forward to it. Because he says in Philippians 1.23, I am in a straight between the two. He says to be depart and be with Christ is far better it's far better to be with Christ. I need to... Here we go. Let me change these settings here. Okay. I didn't have the settings right. So it's far better to be with Christ, so we should actually be looking forward to. That's why Keith Blades, I, read, I mentioned, having cancer, right? Divider there in Canada had cancer. And yet he's looking forward to going home to be with the Lord. Lana, looking forward to go be home with the Lord. She was there in the hospital and they had a mask on her so that she could breathe, oxygen mask. She keeps trying to take it off because she said, I want to go be with the Lord. That's what you call confidence in who you are in Christ. And certainly, I mean, it's not that we're all, you know, there's still the desire to be here because that's what he says in Philippians 1.23. I mean, even though it's far better to, be, to depart and be with Christ, he still says in Philippians 1.23 that he is in a strait betwixt two. So even though he knows it's far better to be there in Christ, the reason he says he's in a strait is verse 24, Philippians 1.24, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So, you know, just like when I was in the hospital, same time as Lana, I didn't, um, I wasn't scared of dying. That's the right word. I wasn't scared of dying, but I didn't want to die. And the reason is because I knew, I didn't know of anybody who had written commentaries from a right division perspective using only the King James Bible, not changing the Bible and not using scholars or anything, just using the Bible as the text and going through the meaning of it. And I knew that I hadn't finished Paul's epistles. So the, my main focus was I wanted to finish that because it's more needful for the members of the body of Christ who are still here if I could finish that to give them edified in the doctrine to come into the knowledge of the truth so that they can have higher positions in heavenly places. So I didn't want to stay around in the flesh in terms of, um, oh, I haven't toured the world or I haven't done this or that. It's the spiritual things that I could still do on the earth. And that's what Paul is saying. And so, of course, you're going to have the... You know, it's not like you're just going to say, well, I'm just going to jump in front of a, a moving bus so I can die or jump off of a bridge so I can be with Christ because that's far better. Um, you still got spiritual things that you say, well, it's more needful that I stay in the flesh. It's more needful for the body of Christ. Or it's more needful for unbelievers. Maybe I can get the gospel to people and they can be saved. So it's more needful for the people who are still here to have Christ live in you and be that ambassador for Christ. And there may be fleshly considerations as well, wanting to nurture your kids or your grandkids in the admonition of the Lord, training them up. And um, So maybe there are a lot of considerations there that you'd say, I still want to be on the earth. And that's what Paul was. I mean, Paul had been, when we get to 2 Corinthians 12, we're going to see he was caught up in the third heaven. So he'd actually been in heaven. He'd seen those things. Um, he knew what it was like, and he says, it's far better than where I am now, and I'd much rather be there. But at the same time, he desired to stay around on the earth to be an ambassador for Christ. But you notice, you have to know, you have to know who you are in Christ. You have to know your eternal security, and you have to know how Christ lives in you by the faith of the Son of God working through you. You have to know those things before you will take that perspective. Otherwise, you're just hoping you make it till the end. I mean, when I was a kid, um, 
they taught, like, like most churches, the age of accountability. And it's around 12. Uh, there were times before I was 12 years old that I was hoping, I prayed that God would take my life before I was 12. Because I knew that if I sinned, I lose my salvation. Then I got to get saved again. And then I'd sin, and I lose my salvation, got to get saved again. It's a terrible way to live. But if if the age of accountability is 12 and I'm under 12, well, then I'm guaranteed to go to heaven. So if God would take my life at, say, age 10, well, then I know I'd make it. I'd be fine. You know, my problems of uh, getting sick and vomiting and not being able to sleep at night are really compounded around that time, around age 12, because I no longer had the confidence that I would go to heaven because the age of, accountab the age of accountability was there, and I knew that once I sinned, I lose my salvation, then I had to get resaved again, and so it just caused more stress. So before 12, I was confident. So I, again, I'd still try to obey the law and try to do what the church says. But when age 12 hit, my teenage years were really difficult till I learned right division. Uh, made it a lot worse there because now I'm accountable. Um, so I'm thinking I'm going to lose my salvation. But there was sort of a, wouldn't call it a peace, but a, a you know, assurance, I guess, that I would be with the Lord if I died before I was 12. So I wanted to depart. Uh, so I make sure I go to heaven because then my surety is gone once I'm 12. Uh, but when you know who you are in Christ, that all your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, you can have that same confidence that you're going to heaven. And so then you don't worry about your salvation. Instead, you let Christ live in you. And so that's why here you notice in verse 6, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And in verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Why? Why is it that we are confident in this? Why is it that we don't put ourselves under the law, that we don't make sure we confess our sins and walk an aisle and get baptized the second, third, fourth, or fifth time just to make sure, you know, better safe than sorry, better get baptized again, or better confess my sins again, or better join the church again, or make a, a new commitment. I'm rededicating my life to the Lord. I've heard that one over and over again. Rededicating, because, well, I thought you were going to heaven. Well, yeah, but, you know, I just want to make sure, just want to make sure, you know, I'm rededicating. I'm showing the Lord that I'm really serious this time. Of course, he knew that I sinned 387 times in the past, and uh, he knows that I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to try to fool him this 388th time, and I'm going to tell him that I really, really mean it, and I'm really, really sorry, and now I'm dedicating my life to the Lord, and he's mine, and that's it, you know. Um, and uh, I can't even fool myself about this, and God knows everything, so you know God knows that I'm going to go back into sin. But I'm going to tell everybody that I made a new commitment, I turned over a new leaf, I've uh, rededicated my life to the Lord, uh, you know, <laughs> you do all this stuff. But you notice what he says here. You don't have to worry about that stuff. I don't have to worry about walking an hour, confessing my sins, keeping short accounts with God. Um, because I am always confident that while I'm at home in the body, I'm absent from the Lord. But then I'm also confident that when I'm absent from the body, I'm present with the Lord. So there's no need for me to put myself under the law and worry about my salvation. Why is it though? Why is it that I'm confident the one in the middle, that little parenthetical phrase in verse 7, that's the answer. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Because if I look by sight, there's no confidence. Because I sinned yesterday, I sinned today, and I'm going to sin tomorrow. Now, maybe I'm not robbing a bank or murdering people, but I know that if I have lust in my heart after a woman, I've sinned. Or if I hate my brother without a cause, I've killed him. Or if I see... I'm driving down the road and I see somebody in a new Corvette and I covet that Corvette. I have sinned. I didn't have to actually carjack it and steal the Corvette. I didn't actually have to sleep with the woman I lusted after. I didn't actually have to kill the, the brother that I hated. Uh, but just the thought in my mind is what did it. And that's what gets you because you know Jeremiah 17, 9, that your flesh is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know you're wicked in your flesh. But you could tell churchianity, you got a big smile on your face and tell everybody you're rejoicing in the Lord and I'm just uh, thanking God for what he's done for me. But inside, 
you're fearful of losing your salvation because you know that you haven't measured up to the perfect standard of the law. And so when you walk by sight, you're not confident. That's why churchianity says, uh, I just hope I can make it. I need to endure until the end. And when they get cancer, they get COVID, and they know their time is short, they uh, worry about not going to heaven. And they say, you know, they've been saying that they follow God and His Word. They say they believe Jesus' death is atonement for their sin, but it's all the front because inside... They're thinking, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I remember this one guy I was going to the Salvation Army at the time in the Sunday school there. And um, he was an ex-Mormon. Uh, he read his Bible every day. Uh, you know, read God's Word. And he was, uh, I remember in the Sunday school class, he just admitted. He says, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it to heaven. And, you know, it's a shock from everybody because you're looking at him and say, this guy is a model member of our church. He reads his Bible every day. Most of them probably did not do that. He prays. I mean, he's got a position there in the church. Um, by all accounts from the flesh, he looks like, you know, if anybody's going to go to heaven, this guy is. But yet, he says, I don't even know if I'm going to make it. Because they taught conditional salvation. So, he knows that, yeah, okay, I read my Bible every day, but you know what? I had lust after this woman, or I hated this person that cut me off in front of me, or I coveted after that nice Corvette that I saw, who, by the way, is the one who, co who cut in front of me, so I committed two sins right there. I hated the guy, and I coveted his car. I did two right there. Um, even though I read my Bible for an hour before I did that, now I lost my salvation. I don't really know if I'm going to make it, because you're walking by sight and not by faith. But when you walk by faith, you say, look at Galatians 2. Look at Galatians 2.16. This is what walking by faith is all about. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So, I read my Bible for an hour. I get in a car. The Corvette guy cuts in front of me, cuts me off. Well, now I'm mad at the guy, so I hate him. So now I've sinned for hating him in my heart. And then I coveted his car, so I, I sinned there. So I committed two sins right there. And I said, okay, I don't really know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Did I really have true saving faith? I know I read the Bible for an hour, but I had these bad thoughts. I had these sinful thoughts. I must not be saved. But notice it says... A man is not justified by the works of the law. So my trust isn't in the fact that I obeyed, thou shalt not covet, or um, thou shalt not um, kill. It's not that. So when I disobey, thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not covet, in my heart, again, I didn't, I didn't kill the guy, I didn't carjack his car. But in my heart, I killed him. And in my heart, I took his car because I coveted it. So I did not do what the works of the law said. So that's why the guilt comes on me, because I placed myself under the law. But it says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay, so I received justification by the faith of Jesus Christ, not by me keeping short accounts with God, confessing my sins, making sure I obey the law. I received salvation by the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay, so how did I get the faith of Jesus Christ? How do I know that I have true saving faith? Churchianity and their conditional uh, eternal security, <laughs> conditional eternal security, that's what they teach, uh, is they're saying you're eternally secure. But if I went out and killed that guy and carjacked his car, well then I never had true saving faith. I was never really saved in the first place. What they're doing then is they're walking by sight. Because they put me under the law. So they say I'm eternally secure because I've trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. But I must not have really done that if I killed the guy and took his car. Because if I had true saving faith, I would not have done that. So what they're doing is they're basing my salvation upon the works of the law. 
Because if I obeyed the law, if I did not kill that guy, if I did not carjack his car, then I am still safe in that view of conditional eternal security. But if I did those things, if I killed the guy and I took his car, well, then I'm not saved. So when they say, well, you didn't really have true saving faith, what they really mean is you didn't keep the law, is what they're saying, because they're basing your true saving faith upon your obedience of the law. Now, maybe if you tell the white lie, or maybe if you hate them in your heart, or you lust after somebody in your heart, then they'll say, well, you know, you still have faith. But um, it's if you do the big things, you know, the murder, the adultery, those things, then you must not have had true saving faith. So they, they don't take the strict standard that my church did of you have some sin in your heart that you dwell in, well, then you've lost your salvation. You've got to get saved again. So they take a, a, it's still a legalistic approach that eternal security people do, but conditional eternal security people. It's still a legalistic approach, but it's not as legalistic as the church I grew up in. So if you avoid the big sins, then you're okay. But you notice what the verse says. It says a man is not justified by the works of the law. So that idea that I never had true saving faith based on the fact that I did not obey the law is not true because I'm not justified by the works of the law, but I'm justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. So how is it that I know that I have true saving faith? How do I know I've got the faith? If I've got the faith of Jesus Christ, according to this verse, then I'm saved. So how do I know I had true saving faith is the question. What's going to tell you? So, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay, how did I get the faith of Jesus Christ? It tells you. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. So, how did I receive the faith of Christ and was justified by the faith of Christ? According to that verse, it says, I believed in Jesus Christ, which... The Galatians are already saved. He didn't share, have to share the whole gospel. But what it means is, I have believed that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again as atonement for my sin. So when I believe that, then I have believed in Jesus Christ, and now I am justified by the faith of Christ. So that's, that's it. It's a done deal. I have the faith of Christ. The moment I believe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. If I, 30 years later, if I never go to church, I never read my Bible, I never do anything else for 30 years, let's say, and then I go and I kill that guy on a Corvette and I take his car, I still had true saving faith because I'm not justified by the works of the law. So I can't base my true saving faith upon the law. Remember Romans 4, 4 and 5 and verse 14 that we read earlier. Faith and the law do not mix. If it's of the law, it's not of faith, and it's of faith, it's not of the law. So if it's by the faith of Christ, then it doesn't matter if I carjack that guy's car or if I kill him or not as far as where I'm going to heaven is concerned. It's all based upon the faith of Christ. And the way I received the faith of Christ, according to this verse, is I believed in Jesus Christ. So if I recognize my sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin, then I have eternal life. I, because I've been given the faith of Christ as a free gift. It says, A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So we need to stop basing our eternal security on if we had true saving faith by if I keep the bigger parts of the law. So as long as I don't murder anybody, I don't go to jail, I keep going to church on a semi-regular basis, uh, I don't commit adultery, and I don't, um, you know, I don't rob anybody, I don't murder anybody. If I, if I do those things then I must have had true saving faith. That's essentially what the doctrine of conditional eternal security that churchianity teaches is about. It's still based upon the law. Not as strict legalism as what I had growing up, but it's still based upon the law. 
But this verse here says that I am not justified by the works of the law. I'm justified by the faith of Christ. And the way I know that I had true saving faith isn't that I didn't carjack that guy's car and I didn't kill him. That's not how I know. It's not by the works of the law. It's that I have believed in Jesus Christ. So if I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin, then I've been given the faith of Jesus Christ and I've been justified by that faith. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, that's what we walk by. We walk by faith and not by sight. Now we want to make the point here, what does that exactly mean? Walking by faith and not by sight. Because just like churchianity has a wrong definition of eternal security, thinking that it's based upon my performance of the law, they also have a wrong definition of faith. A lot of times what churchianity does is they think of faith as something that I don't understand is what it is. It's, um, you know, we'll all understand it better by and by. Um, I don't really understand that passage, but I have faith that it is so. That's usually how people use that context. They use that word faith. Is The context of faith in most of churchianity's minds is faith is something that... Uh, I don't quite understand because God's ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my ways. I don't understand that. But I feel God when I'm at church and I sing the worship songs. I raise my hands and I, I feel the presence of the Spirit. I feel God is with me. And, and so faith is just me trusting God that um, everything will work out okay. He's got it all under control and uh, I just trust that it's so. I don't really understand the Bible. You know, I don't know Greek. I don't know Hebrew. I don't know what version of the Bible I should use in this verse or that verse. I don't understand it like the pastor does or the guy who's gone to the cemetery school. I don't understand those things. I just take it by faith that it is so. That's usually how churchianity looks at faith. It's some mystical thing that I don't really understand. Well, how are we going to walk by faith if you don't understand it? You know, it's just sort of like, uh, you, you know, that, that, that's what they'll say, like the chair. You know, I have faith when I sit down in the chair. They use that example. I have faith. You know, I don't understand how it all worked together, how it was all put together, the mechanics of it. I just have faith that when I sit down, it'll work. Well, that's not faith. That's uh, stupidity. It's, I don't know it. You know, if I, if I look at the chair, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure if I've never seen it before and, uh, and I just go over to it and I touch it and it sort of moves a little bit, you know, it sways. Am I really going to sit down in it? I'm not going to say, well, I have faith that it's good. I'm going to, the point is, I look at the evidence. <laughs> if the chair is wobbly, it's squeaky, it looks rickety, probably not going to sit down in it. I'm not going to say, well, I have faith that the chair will stand up. No. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the evidence. And faith is evidence of the spiritual life. It's not something that I don't know it to be true. I just trust God. God's got it all under control. His ways are higher than mine. I don't know what's going on. I just have faith in God. Well, that's a good thing to believe. I mean, God is going to make it all work out. But faith, if you can't walk by that, in other words. Where is your confidence? You can have confidence that God's going to work it out, you don't understand, even though you don't understand it. Uh, but how do you walk by faith? How do you use it? In other words, if you walk by faith, you're using faith. You're applying it. If you're walking by it, you're applying it. So how do you apply something you don't know? If faith is just the something, well, we'll all understand it better by and by. I just feel God. I feel His presence. And so I know He's with me. How are you going to walk by that? So what faith, it's not that. What faith is, is it's substance and evidence. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Look at Hebrews and chapter 11. And we're going to just to examine what faith is and what it's not because what churchianity calls faith is really the wisdom of the devil. And because it's just based upon feelings, we don't know. We, we just trust it to be so. Because the problem with that is if I haven't examined the evidence, how am I going to walk by it? I don't know. If I don't know, how am I going to do it? So Hebrews 11, verse 1, Hebrews 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence 
of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And there it says, by, through faith we understand. So when I walk by faith, I understand. And what I'm understanding in verse 3 is basically, I'm not trusting in the things which are seen, but I'm trusting, which is the material world, but I'm trusting in the things which do appear. I'm trusting in the spiritual world. How do I do that? How do I trust in the spiritual world and not the material world? It's through faith. It's through faith I understand that what's real is the things which do appear, the spiritual world, the eternal world. And what I can't trust in are the things which are seen because they're temporal, 2 Corinthians 4.18. But I understand that by faith, through faith, it says. If faith is just some mystical thing that I don't understand, God will work, well, I'll understand it better by and by. God's working all things together for my good. God's got it under control. I don't know what he's doing. I don't understand my Bible. I just believe it'll all work out. But here it says, through faith we understand. So it says faith isn't something that's blind faith and we don't know. We just accept that we think it's true and we're just going to trust God. It says through faith we understand. And verse 1 says faith is substance of things hoped for. It's evidence of things not seen. If I don't know anything about that chair, then if I say I don't really have faith, that it's going to keep me up because I don't have any evidence. Faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I need evidence. So how do I get this evidence? How do I get faith? Well, we've seen the faith of Jesus Christ is given unto me when I believe. But, so I've got the mind of Christ. But what did the mind of Christ did? Mind of Christ says, everything that the Father has told me, I'm going to do. Everything that the Father has told me to say, I'm going to say. The faith of Jesus Christ is that he fully trusted in his Father's plan. But you notice he had to understand it. Because if he just said, oh, well, I'll understand it better by and by. I don't know what God wants me to do. I, but I feel good about him because I raise my hands and I sing songs. So I feel his presence within me. Um, so I'm just going to trust God works it all out. Well, then he wouldn't know how to fulfill all those prophecies. He wouldn't know that he'd be sin. He wouldn't know he'd be forsaken by uh, the Father on the cross. He wouldn't know that he would have to conquer sin. He wouldn't know that he would even have to go to the cross. He wouldn't know that he would be killed. He wouldn't know that he had to be suffer things by the Pharisees. He wouldn't know any of this stuff. So then he wouldn't know what his Father wanted him to do. The only way he did and said what his Father wanted him to do is say is because he read the Old Testament, he read God's Word, and he studied it out, and he found out what his father wanted him to do and say. And so that is the substance, that's the evidence. So walking by faith and not by sight means that I read God's Word, I believe what it says, and I make my decisions on that. And then I'm walking by the substance and the evidence of things not seen, because I can't see the results physically, because faith is something that works in the spirit realm. So, I can't see the evidence, I mean, I can't see the, the, uh, the results because I can't see in the spirit realm. I can't see angels, I can't see souls up there in heaven that are saved because I gave them the gospel or people that are in higher positions in heavenly places because I gave them sound doctrine. I can't see the result of that. But what I can do is I know what God wants me to do and I know that God will work those things through me when I apply the doctrine. And so then I have substance and evidence of that, those things in heavenly places by faith. So I can't see them, but it's substance and evidence of the things not seen. The point is, faith isn't just some blind thing that I'm trusting in. Faith is God's word, Romans 10. Romans 10. So first we see that faith is substance of things hoped for, it's evidence of things not seen, and it's through faith that we understand the things of the spirit realm. Romans 10, Romans 10 tells us, Romans 10. Verse 17, Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
So basically, once you're saved, we read in Galatians 2.16 that you're justified by the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ is believing and doing whatever the Father wants him to believe and do. Basically, what it is, is you are part of the course of this world. You are following the law of sin and death before you were saved. You have your sin nature. All you can do is sin. Your spirit's not alive in Christ because it's dead in trespasses and sins. So you can't listen to God through his word because you're not alive in Christ. So before you're saved, all you've got is your flesh. And your flesh dwells no good thing. So all you're going to do is sin. So you operate by the law of sin and death. But Romans 8.2, you're in Romans, look over there at Romans 8.2. Romans 8.2 says that once you're saved, if, by the way, let's read verse 1, Romans 8.1. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Okay, you're in Christ Jesus, and you're not going to condemn yourself when you're in Christ Jesus if you walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So I have to make the decision. Again, I have the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ means to do what the Father wants me to do. Say what the Father wants me to say. Believe what the Father wants me to believe. But I still have my vile flesh. So now I have a choice. I can walk by my flesh, or I can walk by my Spirit. I can walk by faith, or I can walk by sight. But the only way that I am going to walk by faith, do and say what my Father wants me to do and say, is if I know what my Father wants me to do and say. So I've been given the faith of Christ, but basically now I'm a blank slate. Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So before I'm saved, all I did was I operate by the law of sin and death. I have the sin nature in me, so I know how to sin. It's, it's real easy. Real, real easy. It just comes natural because I've got a sin nature. So I can kill. I could steal. I could covet. I could do all those things in the flesh. I could do the so-called good things. I can go to church. I can walk an aisle. I could say I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I could do all this stuff in the flesh. So I operate by the law of sin and death. But once I'm saved, I'm given the faith of Christ. And remember, the faith of Christ is what conquered death. He defeated death in hell. He became sin for us. Uh, he defeated death, so now death has no power over him. He rises from the dead, which means now there's life in Christ, which is why Romans 8, 2 says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So I'm out of the system of the sin and death system, and God has placed me into the system of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And now I can choose which one I want to operate by. The faith of Christ says that I will do and say what my Father wants me to do and say. But if I haven't read God's word, then I don't know what my Father wants me to do and say. It's sort of like, let's say you were living in, uh, I, give it, I mentioned Salvation Army. Here's one thing that they do, and at least they used to. I'm sh sure they probably do it now. Is um, they had what was called an adult rehabilitation center, and what they would do is you'd have somebody who is mainly is alcoholism, drugs as well, but either drugs or alcohol. Usually, it was the reason someone committed some crime and they appeared before a judge, and the judge says, "Well, your sentence is." And there's you know plea bargain or something goes on, and they say, "Well, you could spend six months in jail." or you could spend a year at the Adult Rehabilitation Center to Salvation Army. And what they did there is you're, you know, they're watching you, <laughs> and you're under their rules and what they say to do. And then you have to, then they'll take, uh, uh, bus you over to the church, and you're at the church uh, on Sunday. It's, it's funny, what they do is you see all these group of people come from the Adult Rehabilitation Center, and then when the service is over, man, they were the first out that door, they'd go out, and usually the driver, now the driver works for them, uh, he'd go down the road where the church people weren't, because I followed him one day, I found this out. <laughs> they go down the road, and then they stop, and they all go out and smoke a cigarette. <laughs> because the church, you know, you can't be smoking there, but, you know, they they gone an hour without smoking, and, they, you know, it's hard for them. So they, so they got to get away and go smoke the cigarette. But the point is, you're under a, so let's say alcohol is the problem. 
So you're under alcoholism, and as a result, you end up committing a crime, and so then you're brought before a judge. So you could choose that you're going to operate in the jail now for six months, or you could choose to go to the one year at the Adult Rehabilitation Center. And uh, those are two different systems. If you're in jail, uh, you know, the people there aren't really the nicest people. Uh, they're not going to really operate by the way that the law or the world would want them to operate. I mean, that's why they're there in the first place. There's a different way of life in a prison versus the outside world. Well, if you're at the Adult Rehabilitation Center, they got a lot of legalism. You know, you got to get on that bus. You got to go to the church. You can't be smoking or drinking, but we'll get out of church early and we'll go over there quick and we'll, you know, get a quick puff in before you get back. But, you know, they could do things like that. But the point is, you've got two different ways of living. So you got the way of living in the prison, which, you know, all things go there. You know, you, you, get, you do what you can get away with. And then you got the adult rehabilitation center, which is very legalistic. You got to go to the church. You got to attend the, the Bible studies that they have. You got to do all these things. So you got two different ways of life here. Well, the way um, you, you could choose which one you want to operate in, but the thing is, the only way, if you choose, okay, I'm going to go to the Adult Rehabilitation Center, you got to know what the law is there. So you've chosen, there are two different courses, two different paths. It's the, the prison or the Adult Rehabilitation Center. But you got to know the rule. If you go to the Adult Rehabilitation Center, you got to know the rules of that. You can't just go there and everything's fine. you got to know the rule is, well, you get up at this time, you, have, you eat at this time, you have your Bible study at this time, you... Listen to the, the priest at this time. You go to church on a Sunday. Uh, you know, you got all these rules you have to follow. So you got to understand the rules of that system for it to work. Well, similarly, and maybe that's a bad example, but similarly, before you're saved, according to Romans 8, 2, you are under the law of sin and death. So that's how your flesh works. In your flesh resides sin. you got a sin nature, and all you're going to do is sin, which results in death working in you. The wages of sin is death. That's that system. But the moment you recognize your sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, then God says you are now under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You go back to verse 25 of chapter 7. The last verse in chapter 7, Romans 7, 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Well, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I'm under the law of sin and death. That's all I do. I sin and it works death. I sin and it works death. Who's going to deliver me? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ our Lord delivered me from the law of sin and death. And what he did the moment that I believed the gospel, Romans 8, 2, is now he put me under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So I'm, I've been given the faith of Christ. I'm justified. I'm going to heaven. You can't take that away from me because I've been placed into Christ's death, so I'm also in his life. But how I operate in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, I've got to learn the new system. So here I was, the, the example I gave, alcoholism, and I go to the court. And the court says, you go to prison or you go to the adult rehabilitation center. I say, I take the adult rehabilitation center. I don't want to be in there in that prison with who knows what's going to happen there um, with all those people. I'll go to the adult rehabilitation center. Okay, so you've taken a different course. You're not in prison. You're at the ARC, they call it. So you're at the ARC. But it's not going to work there unless you learn the laws of that system. To learn, you got to get up at a certain time. You got to eat at a certain time. You got to have Bible study. You got to uh, listen to the, the pastor. Uh, they call them uh, captain, actually, or major, because they use military terms. So you got to listen to the captain or the major give the message for the day. Um, then you go to church on Sunday, and you go through all that. So you learn those laws, and you operate in the laws of the ARC. And that's the only way that system is going to work. It's a new system. It's new laws. You never did that. Alcohol, when you were under alcohol, you didn't study your Bible. You didn't, you didn't go to the church. You didn't have Bible study. You didn't have the, the pastor come in. You didn't have all that stuff. It was a different system. But now you've got a new system, and it's great 
because now you can maybe get sober, change, uh, clean up your act, clean up your life, and uh, then you won't have to go to jail. Maybe you won't have all those negative consequences in society. But the only way that works is if you operate by the system. If you say, you know what? I don't want to go to church. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to listen to that pastor. Then the system isn't going to work. You have to operate in the laws of the system that you're in. So for us, before we're saved, we're under the law of sin and death. Bad system. The moment we believe the gospel, we are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But the only way we're going to have the life of Christ Jesus work in us is if we learn the system. So we learn in Galatians 2.16 that we're justified by the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ is I'm going to do and say whatever my Father wants me to do and say. Which meant Jesus, he read his Bible every single day and the Father taught him the Word. So that's what we have to do. So that's why Romans 10 Romans 10, 17 says that faith cometh. Again, we already had the faith of Christ. But when you talk about faith coming, it's really saying about how faith works in you. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now that I'm under the new system, I got to learn the new rules of the system. Remember Romans 8, 2. It said that we were under the law. That's the system, the law of sin and death. But now I'm under the law of of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So I'm under a law, but it's the law of life rather than the law of death. And the way the way life works is by the spirit in Christ Jesus working through me. In Christ Jesus, the way he had faith was he always believed and said what his father wanted him to believe and say. So then the way that I operate in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is I operate by the faith of Christ. Remember, we walk by faith and not by sight. But how do I walk by it? Faith isn't just some blind thing, well, I hope it's true, or I feel God's presence, so I know I must be okay with God. It's, faith is, I gotta know God's word. Jesus says, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth he live. That's how Jesus lived. He lived by faith in what the Father said. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Just like I'm never going to make it in the ARC if I don't know the rules and follow them. You are never going to walk by faith unless you know what God's rules are. What is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? You've got to read Paul's epistles. You've got to get the doctrine in the inner man and make your decisions based on that. If you never read God's word after you're saved, you do have the faith of Christ. You're under that new system. But it doesn't work unless you operate in God's word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if I don't hear the word of God, if I don't read God's word, I don't believe it, then I can't operate it in it because I don't know what it is. So yes, I'm under the new system, but the new system isn't working in me until I read God's word and believe what it says. So walking by faith isn't, well, well I'll just all understand it better by and by. You know, my mom's stuck in California. I don't know why she's there. I guess God just wants her to stay there. I'm just going to trust that God will work it all out for good. You see, that's what that's essentially what churchianity says. I mean, not doesn't sound as stupid as that, but it's, it's pretty close. <laughs> you know, God shut the door, but he's going to open the window. Um, we don't know God's purpose. Our, our, our thing isn't to question why. We just trust in God. We know that all things work together for good. No, walking by faith is you've got to have substance. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Through faith, we understand the worlds that are going to appear. It's different from the world that is seen. Faith means not just some blind thing. It is faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's I get God's word in my inner man. And then I walk by those principles. So just like if you want to get out of alcoholism through the ARC program for the Salvation Army, you go in that program and you learn the rules and you abide by them. For us, if you want the faith of Christ working in you, it's not about you going to church and feeling God's presence. It's about you knowing the rules. You read God's word 
And the faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You read God's word, you believe it, and you apply it. And then you're operating by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus instead of by the law of sin and death. That's the difference. Romans 1, look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's saying, the way I get out of that old system of sin and death, and the way I get into the new system of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is by the gospel of Christ. There's the power of God unto salvation in Christ. Verse 17. For therein. In what? In the gospel. In the gospel. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, what does that mean? So, you have the faith of Christ, right? The faith of Christ is given to you the moment you believe the gospel. What do we read in Galatians 2.16? Galatians 2.16 says, We're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. How do we get it? Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. There's your faith. You believed in Jesus Christ. Your faith. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ. So now the faith of Christ is given to me. So I have faith. I believe in Jesus Christ. I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. As a result, I'm given the faith of Christ as a gift. So I have faith. And as a result, I've got the faith of Christ. What is the faith of Christ? It is to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How do I do that? Well, I've got to read God's word. Again, I'm not going to do any good in that ARC system. I'm not going to get rid of alcoholism and follow the tenets and avoid jail if I don't know the rules of the ARC. i got to follow the rules for this thing to work. If I don't follow the rules, it doesn't work. So too, the rules are the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I've got to know what Christ Jesus would do in a certain situation in order to do it. The way I know it is I read God's word and I believe what it says. See, if I don't do that, Galatians 2.21, it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If I'm putting myself under the law after I'm saved, then Christ's death doesn't work in me. I'm not operating by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I'm operating by the law of sin and death if I'm under the law. But if I'm under grace... I can operate by the faith of Christ. How do I do that? Back to Romans 1. Romans 1. So it says in Romans 1, 16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So I receive the power of God. I receive the faith of Christ the moment I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. And then verse 17 goes on, says, For therein, in the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God revealed. Remember, I want the, not the righteousness of the law, Galatians 2.21, I want the righteousness of God to work in me. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of Christ. So when I look to who I am in Christ, what Christ has done for me, then what I'm doing is I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. I'm getting God's word in my inward man, making decisions based on that. So what I do is, instead of looking at the Bible, saying from a legalistic standpoint, or going to church and saying, I'm going to do what they say to do, I'm not in that system. I'm under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Remember Romans 7. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, is the one who delivered me. So now, I want Jesus Christ our Lord to work through me. So therein, in the gospel of Christ, 
is the righteousness of God revealed from faith. Remember, I believed in Christ, so that's my faith. To faith. That's the faith of Christ given to me as a gift. So you can think of it as, I believe, so now I have faith. Uh, I believe the gospel. Now I've been given the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ always did and said what the Father wanted him to do and say. I couldn't do that in my flesh because I am carnal sold under sin. In my flesh dwells no good thing. I need the faith of Christ working in my spirit, that new system of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I need that new system working in me. But just like with the ARC, I've got to learn the rules of the new system in order for it to work. So when, when I read God's word, then I read it from the point of view of the gospel of Christ, meaning I am dead to sin, I'm alive unto God, and I'm going to operate by the faith of Christ. I'm going to believe what this book says and allow Christ to live this book out through me is what I'm going to do. So therein, in that gospel of Christ, because the gospel of Christ says, I'm a sinner and Christ died for my sins. And he conquered them through his resurrection. So it's in that gospel that I, the righteousness of God is revealed. Not the righteousness of the law, but the righteousness of God is revealed. Romans 3.22 says, uh, the righteousness of God came to me by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. So how is the righteousness of God going to work in me? Well, if it came by the faith of Christ, then it's the faith of Christ working through me. I believe the gospel, so I had faith, and then I've been given the faith of Christ. So when I read God's word after I'm saved, and I believe it according to I am dead, Christ is alive, Christ is the one who conquered sin, then I'm going to read God's word, believe what it says, and then use the mind of Christ to operate in it. And that's why it says, therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So, when I believe the gospel, I'm given the faith of Christ, but I don't really know the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus yet, because I haven't read God's word. So, as I read it and believe it, that's my faith, then the righteousness of God is revealed from my faith to Christ's faith. And so my knowledge of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus keeps growing as I have faith in God's word and the righteousness of God is revealed to me as I believe it and that is transported or deposited into the faith of Christ that's given as a free gift. So now the more that I read and believe God's word, that's why I always say believe because that's my faith. When I read it and believe it, that's my faith. When I believe it, now my faith the righteousness of God is revealed from my faith to his faith, Christ's faith, which is in me. So now the faith of Christ grows. I, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the faith of Christ grows. I know the system of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus better. So then it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just, okay, that's people who are already saved. You're already justified shall live, future, shall live by faith. That's quoted from Habakkuk 2.4. Habakkuk 2.4 says the just shall live by his faith. His faith is Christ's faith. So what it's saying is, verse 16, when I, read, when I believe the gospel, I have faith, and I'm given the faith of Christ. And in that gospel, coming to God's word, understanding that I'm dead in sin, but I'm, a, uh, I'm dead to sin, but then I am alive unto God through Christ, then I'm going to read it from that belief. Not that I'm hoping that I make it, that I keep short accounts with God, but I have confidence, always confident that, uh, of the things of God, the eternal things, looking at those things. So then, as I read and believe God's word, the righteousness of God is revealed from my faith as I believe, to Christ's faith, and so then Christ's faith gets built up more and more, and then I can live, because I'm already just, the just shall live by his faith, Habakkuk 2.4. I live by the faith of Christ. That's why faith is substance, it's evidence, and it's through faith we understand. It's not some mystical thing. Look at James 3, look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3. 
James chapter 3. And what we're going to see is a contrast between the faith or the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. And guess which one churchianity has gone by? The wisdom of this world. They say God's name. They use scripture, but they're using the wisdom of this world. How do I know? Well, I'm reading it here. Verse 13, James 3.13. James 3.13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge amongst you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So how do I see someone who is operating by the faith of Christ? How do I see someone who is living for God? It is somebody who, out of a good conversation, a good lifestyle, his works with meekness of wisdom. In other words, it's showing uh, that he is wise, but there's a meekness or humility behind him. So he's wise in that he's read God's word, he's believed what it says, and he's applying it. That would be the meekness of wisdom. Because if I just have wisdom, you notice a lot of people like geniuses, like uh, what Stephen Hawking, and you get these people with these high IQs, uh, usually they're kind of arrogant. You know, they think they're better than you, right? Because, yeah, well, I've got these all these degrees. I've learned all this. I've taken all this time. You know, I read uh, five books in the last month. How many books did you read? You know, they got this arrogance about them, saying, I've got all this knowledge and wisdom. But here it's, you show your works with meekness of wisdom. It's humility. Well, the only way I'm going to have humility is not because I worked really hard and I studied really hard and I learned all this stuff because I'm smarter than you. It's not that. It's, I'm just dumb enough to let my old flesh get out of the way and believe God's word. And so when I get the wisdom from God, there's no arrogance about it because I didn't get it. Remember, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. IQ, being a genius, reading all kinds of books and studying, didn't mention that. It says, I believe God's word. That's my faith. And then I get the faith of Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And my faith of Christ is built up there. So I've got wisdom of the spiritual things, but it's because God gave it to me as I read and believed it. So it's not about me being smart, being a genius or anything like that. It's because God revealed it to me through his word, through his spirit. So I've got wisdom, but I've got meekness of wisdom because I didn't do it. Not going to be some arrogant genius because it's God who did it for me. So I, I, there's, there's going to be humility. So there's meekness of wisdom, it says. So the wise man shows out of his good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Verse 14, James 3:14. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, or the wisdom here, is the bitter envy and strife. That's, of course, the worldly wisdom. This wisdom descendeth not from above. Okay, so how do you get the wisdom of this world where you got bitter envy and strife in your hearts and you lie against the truth? What is that? It is earthly. Okay, we got that. It's of the world. It's sensual. It's feelings. It's my sensual senses. So what does churchianity say? I feel God's presence today as I'm singing these songs. I sing the songs and I feel God's presence so then I know that I'm saved. But then I do some things in the week and I don't really know, you know, if I've confessed all my sins, if I got fellowship. So I got to go back to the church on Sunday, sing the songs again, and see if I feel the presence of God again. If I feel the presence of God, then I'm okay with God. I've got fellowship with Him. I must have done what I needed to do to confess my sins or whatever it is. That's sensual. It's senses. It's based upon my feelings. And what is that? So it's earthly, it's sensual, and it's devilish. It's of the devil. So when a church says, when a church member says, I know I'm saved because I feel God's presence, that verse right there says, that is wisdom of the devil. You don't listen to that. What about the wisdom of God? Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above, that's God's wisdom, is first pure. Psalm says, uh, God would preserve his words. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace seven times. That's what God's word is. It is pure. What does that mean? It's without error. So I can try it. I could say, I can apply the doctrine, the word of God, and it's going to work every single time. Now, physically, materially, doesn't mean I'm going to have health and a lot of money, but it means spiritually it's going to work. 
um, God says, uh, 2 Corinthians 2.14, God always causes us to triumph in Christ. In Christ. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The person who says, I feel like I know I'm okay with God because I feel His presence when I sing that song, is a hypocrite. Because I mentioned before, they'll say at church, oh, I know I'm safe. I know I'm going to heaven. When that guy who read his Bible every day says, I don't know if I'm really safe, you know, everybody was shocked. Um, they thought in their heart, they weren't sure they were saved either because they're under a church that teaches conditional salvation. But um, they put on the act. You know, I, you know, everybody knows that we don't really know, that we know, that we know for sure that we're going to heaven because we may have done something that we shouldn't have done or, you know, we didn't keep short accounts with God, but we're never going to reveal that. So here's the guy revealing it, and he's a guy who reads the Bible every day. He's one of the best ones of us, and he's saying that. You know, they're shocked because, hey, you're blowing my cover. You know, I was looking pretty good coming in here. I dressed up. I had a big smile on my face. I was looking good. You did the same thing, but you just admitted that you don't know if you're going to heaven, and they know you read the Bible more than me, so I don't know how that's going to make me look. They're hypocrites. They say they're going to heaven. They say they're rejoicing in the Lord, but inside they're not assured. But if you've got the wisdom that is from above, it's without hypocrisy. Why? Because it's not based on sensual, it's not based on feelings, it's based on knowing. Faith isn't, well, I just trust God that it's true. Faith is substance, it is evidence. By faith we understand. How are you going to walk by faith if you don't know the things of God? I, don't, I can't walk by it. I can't live in the ARC system if I don't know what the rules are. I can't live by the faith of Christ if I don't know what the rule of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is. So I got to read God's word, get it in the inner man and live by it. And when I do that, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, I walk by faith and not by sight. So when I walk by faith, I've got substance. I've got evidence that the things of the spirit are true. That's why he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, we are always confident. And verse 8, we are confident. So, that's what, if you don't have that confidence, not, oh, I feel it, no, not, not feeling it. You've got to have substance. You've got to have evidence. If you haven't read God's Word and believe what it says and applied it, then you're not looking at the things above, setting your focus on those things, and you don't know for sure that you're even going to make it, much less your reward. So then you're not going to do chapter 4. You're not going to be in chapter 4, verse 8, trouble on every side, yet not distressed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. If I go to that gym every day and I gain fat and I don't gain muscle and I feel worse and I'm more out of breath, I'm not going to go because I say it's not worth it. And that's what churchianity does when it comes to God's Word. The reason they don't read their Bible and believe it and apply it is because they don't understand the life of Jesus. They haven't set their affection on things above. They're not always confident of even going to heaven, much less having an eternal reward there. So since they're not looking at the things above because they're walking by sight and not by faith, then they don't allow the suffering, and the persecution to come. And instead, the health and wealth gospel is preached, where they walk by sight and not by faith. But if we walk by faith and not by sight, meaning we read God's word, believe what it says, and apply it, then we are always confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We're not worried about losing our salvation. Instead, we're saying, I've had it by the faith of Christ, but I don't know what God wants me to do yet because I haven't read God's Word, so I'm going to read it and I'm going to believe it and the righteousness of God is going to reveal from my faith to His faith, Christ's faith, and the faith of Christ in me is going to be built up more and more and I can live by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus more and more. Let's close in a word of prayer. 
Dear Lord, we thank you for the system of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Help us to operate in that by understanding that it is by the faith of Christ that works in us, not by some mystical feeling thing, but by us getting in God's word and believing what it says and applying those principles so that we can be always confident of the things that we have in heavenly places, so that we're good ambassadors for Christ, letting other people know of the salvation that is in you so that they may be saved, giving them sound doctrine through right division so that they may come into the knowledge of the truth, building up your kingdom in heavenly places as we live by the faith of the Son of God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.